Hello. Welcome to uh, my first, hopefully of several, video Q and A's based on my top 100 prospects list. Um, if you don't recognize me, it's because I have glasses now. I'm an old man. Apparently, I can't see. It is funny how I put these things on. Suddenly, the words got bigger. It's very weird. I've never worn glasses in my life. Made it to 47. And finally, my one of my eyes particularly betrayed me. So I will be taking questions today, mostly on the top 100 list, which ran last Thursday, and the list of a dozen guys who just missed the list, which ran yesterday, Monday. If you are looking for org rankings or team-by-team -team reports, top 20 prospects per team, those will begin to run next week. The current schedule, which is still always subject to change, is that that will start to run on February 10th and roll out over the seven days following that. It will start with the org rankings. Um, I say that it's subject to change because I haven't written most of that yet. And let me tell you, a snow day today was not what I needed. So let us move to some of the questions. Um, this is such a great year, great read, year in and year out from Keith Law. Thank you. Thank you so much. He is pretty bullish on the top twins prospects. I think I am. You particularly loved what I had to say about Duran and Balazovic. Okay, that's not a question, but thank you. I appreciate the kind words. Um, I suppose at some point, I'll, I'll hold off. I, a couple of people were asking about Trevor Larnack. Let me put a pin in that. We'll get to that later as a Twins prospect who did not make the list. Okay, next. Man, the A's pipeline is rough. I guess we'll just have to see if Chapman or Olsen gets traded first for a package of prospects. Oakland really does make it hard on fans sometimes. I have to say I'm always a little befuddled by the fact that the A's farm system is not that good. Um, it hasn't been for a while, and I feel like it's kind of a mixture of everything. They haven't hit that well in the draft, not badly. And obviously Chapman and Olsen were draft products, so give them credit for that. AJ Puck, I still think, has a chance to be something. Uh Hopefully he can stay healthy. He was a draft guy. I like Nick Allen a lot. His ceiling might be limited by his size, but I do like him, and I think he's a big leaguer. He was a draft guy. So, but they need to. They, they clearly need to be more productive in the draft. They really have not done a whole lot on the international front. Um, had not had success on that front, and it's been trades and the uh, the kind of stuff we associate with the the money ball A's of almost 20 years ago now finding guys off the scrap heap and finding unappreciated value elsewhere. I mean, that's great, but it's tough to sustain. I feel like if you want to have sustained contention and you're going to run tiny payrolls like the A's do, then you need a better farm system. And I don't think I'm overly pessimistic. The system's really quite thin. And after five names, I would say their system drops off fairly quickly. So, I don't know if that means Chapman and Olsen get traded, but and of those two, I would keep Chapman and trade Olsen in a heartbeat. You can find a Matt Olsen. At Chapman's are pretty hard to find. Uh, but it just means they're they're constantly going to be dancing to get around the weak weakness of the farm system. Uh, thanks for making me less productive at work this morning. Ha, good to see three Boston prospects make the list. Yeah, they're headed in the right direction. That was a system that I think I said a year ago, after a full season, guys getting healthy, guys getting a chance to play full years, we might view that system in a much better light. And then we didn't have a season. So just about everything I said about systems improving, sleeper prospects, et cetera, I'm keeping all of that. I think all of that will probably still be true, um, or at least I'll hold to those predictions. And that's true of the Red Sox. My guess is 12 months from now, we like the Red Sox system a lot more than we like it right now. By we, I mean me. Will I have Groshans, Jordan Groshans, back on next year if he can stay healthy this year? Well, uh, first of all, let me note that he was on the list of guys who just missed the top 100. So a guy being 105th versus being 85th is really not that big of a difference. People tend to over-exaggerate on versus off. This is not a binary construct here. It's not that there are exactly 100 prospects in baseball. And if you don't make Keith Law's list of the top 100 prospects, then Keith is saying, you're not a prospect. It doesn't work that way. Way more than 100 prospects in the minors. Lots of guys in the minors with plenty of ability. In a lot of cases, we're just dealing with a bit of a vacuum of information. That is true of Groshans. He's barely played. He played about six weeks in 2019, got hurt, missed the rest of the year, obviously didn't play in 2020. He went to the Jays alternate site. That's great. I'm glad they brought him. I think the Jays are doing a lot of really good things on the development side now. As for whether Groshans gets back onto the top 100 next year if he stays healthy, he's got to stay healthy and perform 
and we have to see that what made him a first rounder two years ago, that's almost three years ago now, is still intact. That's several ifs. I actually think that's all going to happen. My guess is he has a top 100 prospect a year from now. I'm not especially worried about him, but these things have to happen. I really wonder, how do you rate someone like Jason Dominguez, Yankees, Yankees number two prospect? I think he was around 55 to 60 on the list. There were only a few Twitter videos of him and some pictures. Okay, that's what you have access to, and that's great. Um, folks like me who do this full time, like Eric Long and Hagen at Fangraphs, Jonathan Mayo and Jim Callis over at MLB, um, Kylie McDaniel now at ESPN, we have access to more information than that. We get access to other videos. We can sometimes get access to StatCast type data for teams that are willing to share that stuff. And we just talk to scouts, talk to scouts and executives. That's a huge part of the job. In the case of Dominguez, I spoke to scouts who saw him as an amateur. I spoke to scouts who, uh, I didn't speak to anybody who disliked him as an amateur. They all thought he was a very good prospect. There were some questions about, you know, that's that a 16 year old's body. It's so mature. Where does the body go from here? You can't get bigger, not in a good way when you're already built like that at that age. And some questions about, you know, are we overrating the hit tool because he's so strong at 16? This happens a lot with American high school kids where the kid who, hey, he's the best 14 year old hitter in the country right now. No, he's just bigger. And if you hit your growth spurt first at 14, and all the other 14 year olds are still little shrimps running around on the field. Like, of course, you're going to look like the best player. That doesn't actually make you the best prospect. That could be in play with Dominguez. Now, he is really explosive. He's got bat speed and he's got running speed and he can really launch the ball. And again, lots of scouts who didn't, who were not, who weren't with the Yankees, who saw, saw him, their teams lost out to the Yankees in the bidding. They still liked him. So I'm not worried about him. But I will say this when you're asking about how do I rate someone like that? If we had a year of production from Dominguez that matched up with a lot of the scouting reports, he'd be in the top 20. We just don't have any data. And in the cases where we have little to no data, I try to be conservative. I think that's just the appropriate way to value guys where there is limited information because that's how front offices would value these guys. What about Hudson Head, Hudson Head, who was just traded from the Padres to the Pirates? I only ask because you had him as a potential list maker in my write-up of the uh, Pirates. Padres trade. He was on the that just missed list that ran on Monday. So please do check that out. There were a dozen names on there. I can see there. In fact, the next question is about Miguel Amaya. He was also on the just missed list. So do check that out. That's not everybody. But just as it's turned out, a lot of the guys that you, the reader, are asking about were, in fact, on that list. A bummer to see Royce Lewis drop so far. Whoop, lost it here. To drop so far after being so high a few years ago. Uh, he could come back. I don't want you to feel like I have Lewis down around 40 or so on the list. I apologize. I've, I'm, I actually have two different computers here, and my list is on the other one, um, as well as four open games of Grand Austria Hotel for the board gamers among you. Um, and I, so far, I think I'm really losing one of them quite badly. It's very embarrassing. Um, Lewis can come back. The things that made him a first-round pick are largely still there. He is still an 80 runner. He is still a high IQ baseball player. Uh, his hands are still quick at the plate. He, he's not a shortstop. I think he's ne I've never thought he was a shortstop. I've always thought he has to go to center field, and I think we're getting to that point. The big issue with him is that he, on his own, made some changes to his swing and stance, swing mechanics in his stance, and he needs to undo that. The Twins are aware of this. They've been working on it. It takes time. And now, of course, we have to see this. The last time we saw Royce Lewis in games, he was still doing with the high leg kick and the big hand hitch, and he's not going to hit like that. And I don't know why he's trying to hit for power that he just doesn't have, but obviously somebody got in his head and said that, um, oh, you know, you need to try to drive the ball more. Mm, it's not his game. He should be a leadoff guy, doubles on base, steals, great defense in center. I still think he can get back to that, but until he does, I have to evaluate him first and foremost on the player he is and only secondarily on the player that I think he could be. Serious question. Um, silly questions are also welcome. With the lack of in-games and play from a lot of these prospects last year, what is the general methodology for moving guys up and down? I That's a good question. I spoke to Eric Loggenhagen on his uh, the Fangraphs audio podcast last week, 
about just that. To summarize, in most years, I am using a combination of uh, information from lots of different sources. I am using, first and foremost, my own in-person evaluations when, when I've seen the player. I saw basically nobody last year because we had a pandemic. So that's basically it. I use scouts observations. I use notes from player development people with each of the 30 teams. And I use data, performance data, and where possible, StatCast type data. Uh, this year, I had to lean much more heavily on what the individual teams were telling me about players, particularly about what happened at the alternate sites because nobody else was there. They didn't allow scouts. I have spoken to some scouts who went and saw Instructional League. There were not that many. A lot of teams didn't send scouts out for safety reasons or for fiduciary reasons, but some teams did. Those are the smart teams. If they were, if the scout, you know, if they felt like they were safe and the scouts were willing to do it, by all means, go get that information. Um, and I do think it actually helped uh, teams make trades this winter because they're they're using that information. So I feel like my lists this year are going to be more informed by the teams themselves. That's not great. I'm not really happy with that. I am going to finish this process and you'll get the same amount of content and it will be the best I can give you, but I will leave this process less satisfied than I do in most years. And I'm particularly eager now to get back out there and evaluate players myself again, because I think that's what I do reasonably well. And I think it's an essential part of my job. Uh, another Jordan Groshans question. It's in, the, he's in the just missed column on Monday. It's, I gotta just keep pointing you back to that. I, I wrote about that already. Uh, great job here, Keith. Thank you. I'm glad to see you are the potential high man on Abrams. What would you call the hit tool? 60 or higher? His present hit tool, if you drop CJ Abrams in the big leagues, it's probably a 50. That's pretty aggressive for a kid who's 20 with, what, a summer, basically, of pro experience. I think he can get to up to maybe a 70 hit tool if you're really talking absolute ceiling. I would not think you'd drop this guy in the big leagues and he'd hit 300 or better right now with some impact. Um but that is not saying I'm down on him. It's just, you just said hit tool. You didn't say present or future. And I think those two are always going to be different on position player prospects, unless they're already at the door or, or have debuted in the big leagues. Uh, who does Keith think could move up the furthest from this year to next year's list? Gosh, that's a good question. And a little tricky without the list in front of me. I will say, um, Jason Dominguez, somebody I mentioned earlier, somebody I think could definitely make a huge leap. Uh, or Elvis, um, Martinez with the blue Jays is a guy I thought was going to make a big leap last year. And I just didn't get to play. Uh, Nick Abel was on the just missed list. I am as a philosophy now being more conservative with high school pitching, um, uh, in the draft. And you will see that reflected in pro ball until they've pitched some and in Abel's case, he just obviously didn't get to pitch at all. He didn't pitch at all this year, except for instructional league. He didn't get to pitch in the spring in high school, no summer, just a little bit instructional league. I really like Mick Abel. Uh, somebody was mad. Some Phillies fan was, he, I'm determined to avoid giving Mick Abel hype. That is hilarious. Um, I don't know what possible motivation I would have for not giving somebody hype, but um, I love Mick Abel. But I'm just trying to be appropriately conservative with these guys, uh, with these high school pitchers specifically. Uh, let's see. Quick question about a prior list. Way too early to say Gavin Lux was way overrated or is 2020 just a one up? Uh, way too early to say that. Absolutely. Absolutely not. First of all, throw out 2020 for basically everybody. Second is he did have COVID. Who knows what effect that had on guys. But also like, lots of rookies struggle their first time up. Look at what Mike Trout did his first 100 Ish at bat. Yeah, it was 100, about 128 at bats in the big leagues, nearly lost rookie status, and then came back next year and he was Willie Mays. So do not, do, just don't think to call guys overrated off of basically a two month sample. Uh, not every prospect develops at the same rate. They don't all develop when we want them to, but I absolutely believe in Gavin Lux for the long term. How about Luis Robert? Well, how about him? Um, you got to give me a little bit more than that. He is not a prospect. If you're wondering why he's not on the list, lost his rookie eligibility. He was in the top 10 last year. Um, I noted some, uh, I noted some real issues with Robert's approach at the plate. And I think you saw that last year. There are quite a few ways to get this guy out. Uh, I, I, it, you could say that there are holes in his swing, really holes in his approach. And, uh, he's going to be limited as a player until he addresses those. How do I feel about the Cubs system after the Darvish trade and the international signing? Uh, 
not great. It's still down. It's still way down. Um, you know, they did really well when they drafted higher. And now that they've drafted lower, they've had trouble finding equivalent value. Um, and they've changed scouting directors and they've changed their approaches a few times. And Ed Howard was an interesting pick. It's not a guy they take, I think, anywhere in the first you know, five, six years. Any time when Theo was still in, in charge before last year, I don't think they take an Ed Howard in the first round. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, is Drew Jones more of an Andrew Jones jo clone? It's a tongue twister than Christian Pache is. I have never seen Drew Jones, so I couldn't tell you. But knowing how genetics work, probably, unless you're telling me something about Christian Pache's parenthood that I wasn't actually aware of. Why was Trevor Larnock not included for the Twins? I knew he'd come up. Okay, first of all, let me be clear. Uh, the answer, the first answer to all of this is that I believe there are 100 prospects, more actually, better than Trevor Larnock. That is the simplest explanation. It does not actually mean that there is something wrong with Trevor Larnack. In this case, there isn't really anything wrong with him, but there are lots of prospects I like better than him. I see Trevor Larnack as a fairly one-dimensional player. He's a corner outfielder who's not likely to be much of a defensive asset and whose approach at the plate has always yielded some questions for me. I think he will be a perfectly fine regular. I don't think he's going to be much more than that. I would absolutely rather roll the dice in guys who might play in the middle of the field, pitchers with you know top to middle of the rotation upside, or corner guys who have maybe more obvious power or are more likely to be great defensive players. Again, it's not saying Trevor Larnick stinks. It's just saying I think there's 100-plus guys better than he is. Upside-wise, where does Matt Allen rank among right-handed prospects? I, I can't answer that. You know, I haven't really sat down and ranked right-handed pitching prospects for upside. So it's, it's kind of an unanswerable question. I'm sorry. Do I like the chances of Gabriel Arias using his hit tool, using tech like VR for pitch recognition? No. Let's not, let's not pretend, pretend the technology is a panacea. And it's not just pitch recognition in Arias's case. There's, there's a lot of reasons why he doesn't hit. And the fact that he was on my just missed list at all is really just a reflection of what a good defensive player he is and the speed he's got and his age. Sometimes guys like that just find a way to get better. They surprise us. But I don't see a direct path for him to get from where he is now to a 45 hit tool. Uh, thoughts on Jason Dominguez? I think I answered that a little bit earlier. Uh, hey, Keith, big fan. Do you think there's more power to come for Nick Madrigal? No. Where would it come from? I mean, this guy, is not, he makes some of the weakest contact of anybody in baseball, like he did last year. And that's unsurprising because that's always been who he is. He's listed at 5'8", 150. I think he's actually shorter than that um, at that point. Not that it makes a huge difference. It's the 150 that's bothersome. You look at his frame. He is not going to put on a lot of muscle. He is not going to start making much harder contact. He'd have a way to go just to make average quality contact. He's a single sitter. And he's such a single sitter that pitchers aren't afraid to attack him. So, okay, he's going to put a lot of balls in play. He's not going to get a lot of walks. He's not going to get on base at a high clip. He hit 340 last year, and neither his on base percentage nor his slugging percentage got even as high as 380. Now, it's a small sample, but that's consistent with the player he's been basically since he got out of high school. Just logged on, O'Neill Cruz is a ball player. He's not a shortstop. He's way too tall to be a shortstop. I'm not 100% convinced he's going to stay in the infield, and he's going to strike out a ton. He is still a prospect because there's a lot of natural ability there. There's definitely some offensive upside. Maybe he ends up in center field and turns into a good defensive player. That's a lot of question marks. Again, the answer is there are 100-plus players better than he is. Uh, I'm assuming these two questions go together. Please elaborate more on Julio Rodriguez, why number 24? because there are 23 prospects I think that are better than he is. I also am not sure if you're asking me, is that too high or too low in your, uh, in your question? Um, if you're asking me why he's not higher corner outfielder, long swing questions about contact rate and pitch recognition. I don't stuff corner guys unless they can really hit Andrew Vaughn and Spencer Torkelson who are older college guys, more data available. Those guys can both really hit. We have a pretty good idea that they're going to hit. Now, we don't know exactly how good they're going to be, right? It's always true. Justin Smoke. Justin Smoke's a guy I thought would be a much better big leaguer. 
but he managed to carve out what a 10 year career as a, you know, below average regular, you know, high quality backup. Um, could Andrew Vaughn turn it to Justin smoke? Yeah. Yeah. I think about that one a lot. They don't look alike. I think it's just more like corner bats, not great athletes, first base only, but, um, you got to show me something that you can really hit if you're going to be a corner only guy, especially if you're not going to provide a lot of defensive value. When a team has uh, traded for a prospect this off season, and a player was not at the alternate site. They're just relying on what the other team is telling them. No, they have past history. They have past scouting reports. They could ask for a video from the alternate site. Obviously everybody was filming stuff from the alternate site. And a lot of those players did play at instructional league. So, that's also um, possible um, that they scouted them there. Some players played in these little ad hoc independent leagues. I just wrote about a prospect who went and played in a collegiate summer league for a couple of weeks just to get some reps. Jake Berger, I think it was, with the White Sox, uh, who's just a name to name to keep in mind. You know, people have forgotten about him. He hasn't played in three years, but would not be surprised if he could if he turned out to be a um, bounce back prospect this year post hype prospect, something like that. Just keep an eye on that one. Um, and also guys are filming stuff at home. They're supposed they're filming themselves and sending the footage into the teams. The teams could share that with other teams also. Hearing a lot of hype on Quinn Priester, deserved. Well, he's a really talented 19, I guess probably 20 year old pitcher in the pirate system who at least has shown a little bit now since he signed. He looked really good in instructional league. I loved him in high school. Um, I don't know that he's got really top of the rotation upside, but I think he's got a pretty good chance for a kid that age and that experience level, assuming he stays healthy, for a kid that age to end up a mid-rotation star. How can I can Elvis Martinez get as he matured? I think I just answered that. I think he can get towards, you know, he can be in the top 25 of prospects across baseball. Um, he's got a hit. So many of these guys, we just have to see them play. It's so much easier to be aggressive ranking a player who's played in full season ball than it is to rank a guy who's only played in short season complex leagues or simply not played at all, only played college or amateur. You read the write-up on Wander Franco, but don't understand why he is so much higher than everyone. Um, well, he's only one spot higher than Mackenzie Gore for that. But this is a shortstop for now, still a shortstop with elite bat to ball skills who makes pretty consistently hard contact. A shortstop who is likely to hit for high average, who rarely strikes out, and who already has power with the high probability based on his contact quality already in his youth, likely to get some more power. I mean, if this is a shortstop, he's going to hit 320 with a high 300s on base percentage, 20 homers a year, and be able to play the position solid average. Guy's probably going to get some MVP votes, and he's a baby. He is one of the youngest players on the list. Uh, what does Brett Beatty need to do to make the list? Once again, Brett Beatty being on the just miss list, which he was, is not a comment that he's not a good prospect. But he is now a 21-year-old, probably first baseman, who has yet to play full season ball. That's not great. And I don't love holding age against guys to this extent, but... This was the problem with Beatty being a 19-year-old high school senior. He had to race through to get to high A just to avoid being too old for his levels. And I like Brett Beatty, but he's going to be a first baseman. He, he got a rake. Um, we don't know. We think he will, but he, we don't know. And I am absolutely going to rank that guy below guys who we know more about them. We, know, we have more performance data where they can play somewhere in the middle of the field. We know they're going to provide more defensive value. Uh, what do I feel is the best source for info on yet to be drafted prospects? Well, I mean, I cover that. I haven't written anything about it yet this year because really been sort of playing a little wait and see when are we going to start? Are we going to have a season? The colleges are talking a really good game. They're going to play February 19th. And then I see that and I see this college basketball game's been canceled. And this one's been canceled. And there's a lot of self-delusion going on on that front. This pandemic is not over. And as much as I'm glad that there are vaccines now my wife's already gotten her first dose these variants are coming fast and people are still i mean i was just in a grocery store the other day and saw two ding dongs couldn't even wear the damn mask properly the mask goes over your nose stupid not here over your nose 
anyway, this ain't over. And I'll be very surprised if we get through a full college season without some kind of interruptions. Or they just never have fans. Uh, is JT Ginn a guy I could see making next year's list? No. No. Um, is a Kiebert Ruiz trade inevitable given the fact that the Dodgers now have Will Smith Cartaya and now Jesus Galiz? Galiz is like, he ain't a factor. Uh, Smith and Cartaya are enough to put Ruiz on the trade block, and he is on the trade block. He's available. If you call, if the Dodgers call about one of your veteran players, they're probably going to offer you Ruiz. That's come up. I've heard that from multiple other teams. He's just available in trade. And it has made people think that Ruiz – that there might be something wrong with Ruiz, that the Dodgers maybe know something they're not sharing. I actually don't agree with that. I think it's just the Dodgers saying, we got it. We got our catcher of the present. We got our catcher of the future. Ruiz is a nice player. He isn't, we don't need him. That's an area of strength from which we can trade. Do I like the Royal strategy over the last few drafts and picking mainly college starting pitching? Yes. At some point you have to move away from that. And they did with Bobby Witt Jr. Now, I actually wouldn't have taken Witt Jr. in that particular spot, which is not a criticism. Um, but I like the fact that they said college pitching, college pitching, college. oh, we draft now, now we're drafting second. Let's go for ceiling. Those college pitchers all came in the back half of the first round, comp round, second round, in drafts that had good college pitching crops too. So they were also kind of going after strength, the strength of the draft class. Um and last year, they took Asa Lacey, who I argued if, the, if we'd had an entire spring, he might have been 1-1. And maybe the Tigers would have said, we don't want to take another college pitcher first overall. Okay, fine, fine. Hypothetically, Asa Lacey, best college lefty, up to 97, with a good changeup. You know, if he has a full spring, stays healthy, throws a few more strikes, shows some development of the breaking ball, that guy could go 1-1. A lot of years, that guy goes 1-1. So, you know, to me, that was a perfect – fit for the Royals where, well, we like to take college starters. Oh, there's a college starter with a lot of upside. Perfect. Perfect to take that guy. I don't think they're going to just keep taking college starters though. I expect them now that they've got this really nice base and it's quite a few guys more than you've seen already in the big leagues, this base of college starters approaching the big leagues that you will see them expand a little bit and go for some upside guys, especially while they're drafting in the top 10. Do we need a spotlight to look for Hunter Green? Does he still have hype? I mean, he's on the top 100. You, you got to read the list. I'm sorry. I, I wrote a whole thing about the, but it's right there. It's like literally like right over there. Go, go read it. And I will, I don't know if you'd call it hype, but I hope it's up to date information. How do I balance proximity to majors and upside in my rankings? Um, that is a difficult question. I consider both. Uh, I do favor upside, but it's got to have some probability to balance it out. Like I'm not just taking the guy with 80 power who doesn't know how to hit. I'm not taking the guy who just throws a hundred and doesn't have a second pitch. I mean, that's Garrett Crochet, right? Garrett Crochet literally throws a hundred from the left side. Um, he doesn't really have a second pitch. He's had some trouble staying healthy and he hasn't thrown a lot of strikes. Certainly not when working as a starter in college. So that guy's in the majors and he has do you know, a great 80 pitch. But there's a lot of questions, a lot of uh, a lot of things that I think limit his upside. Um, do I compare? I don't compare to other sites. I have said before. I said earlier, you know, Kylie, Eric, the MLB guys, Baseball America guys, we do this full time. Um, I'm friends with a lot of those guys. Uh, when I got engaged or when I got married, you know, JJ Cooper sent me a text to say congratulations. He's a, an amazing guy. Like. We are all pretty friendly. We all do the same thing. Those of us who, this is our job, covering prospects. There's only, what, six of us? Um, we're our own little club. So I, when I say do we compare, like May, John and Mayo and I, and Eric and I in particular, we'll talk about our lists with each other. But it's not a, you're right, you're wrong. Oh, you're too high on this guy. It's, it's Hey, what'd you hear on that? Oh, I heard something different. Okay, well, that's interesting. Maybe I should think about that going forward. Oh, maybe I should take a second or third look at a guy. I respect the work that these guys are doing. When you do this full time, you gather a lot more information. This is not something I think you can do as a hobby. Um, you know, as it is, I have a hard time, I would say myself, 
being a draft guy and also being a pro prospect guy is a one man show. I've done it for a long time. And obviously a few of you think I do a good job, but it's hard. And so I have a lot of respect for all the guys who do this full time, even though obviously we disagree substantially on players. We will, but just understand that it is a disagreement between professionals where there's a lot of mutual respect. Anything delivery wise that is present preventing Luis Medina from having at least average control. No. And I described that in the write up. If you read the just missed list, I said, his delivery is good. He's a great athlete. He's got great stuff. If he throws strikes, he's going to fly onto the list. I am in, but he got he's just got to prove it. And um, somebody asked me on Twitter, uh, Rich Dallas asked me on Twitter, why wasn't he on the list? I said, you know, after he was great this winter, which he was, Medina was great in the Puerto Rican Winter League in five abbreviated outings. I am trying not to read too much into small samples. It's small sample and it's recency bias. I'm trying to avoid that. But I like Medina, and he could be their best pitching prospect in six months. Is C.J. Abrams going to be on Tatis' level? I don't think he's ever going to have that kind of power. Worried about teams being able to fill all the innings pitch needed quite the jump for everybody. A lot of guys did pitch at alternate sites last year. So there are a lot of guys kicking around who actually threw 50 innings last year. You just didn't see it because it's not on the stat sheet. And I think more of those guys are going to end up pitching in the big leagues. Um, it does seem like we're going to expand the rosters by one for this year. And I'm very on board with that. As somebody who hates lots of pitching changes, I'm still okay with that. Gabriel Moreno, top 100 worthy. Well, he's not on it now. Um, do I think he could be next year? Absolutely. That's a catcher in the Blue Jays system. He's really good. Um, that's a guy who, if he plays a full year in 2020, he might just be on the list, right? Which is, you know, there are a lot of guys out there who I really like, whose teams really like them. Scouts really like them. They didn't play this year. And so we think they got better, but we don't really know. And we won't know until they get out and play. I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but it is the common theme for so many of these players that people want to hear more about. Hell, I want to see Gabriel Moreno. I want to see Aurelis, Miguel Geraldo, and um, Leo Jimenez. I and mean, this is just, I'm just naming Blue Jays guys. I'm just naming Blue Jays guys from the, their international scouting department has done an incredible job lately. Uh, they, uh, Machado is the other one, uh, Steven Machado. They have some guys, some capital G U Y S guys coming on the international side who haven't really played. A little bit of, you know, some guys have gotten just a low A. Some guys haven't gotten out of short season. Some guys haven't played at all yet. You know, if you could drop me somewhere tomorrow in spring, minor league spring training, just drop me on the backfields at the need. And I'll get some bad flashbacks, but absolutely. Like they've got some guys coming and some of the Moreno is a good pick to make a big jump next year. <sighs> With Gorman now potentially blocked by Arenado at third base, is he athletic enough for a move to left field or right field? Yes. He'd probably be good in right field. Don't be surprised if they try to move him around too and maybe try him at second. I doubt it, but why not? Play him some at first and play him in both outfield corners. Also, maybe he ends up trade bait at some point, and that's not a knock on him, but if the Cardinals look around and say, hey, we need another starting pitcher, well, we're set at third for a little while. Lots of possibilities. You don't rush to move a prospect off a position until you really have to. And in Gorman's case, he was two years away from the big leagues anyway. So I say... Let him stay at third base. Try him some other places to add some flexibility, but let him develop as a third baseman. The worst thing that happens is he turns out to be a really good third base prospect, and you have a decision to make because you have plenty. Plenty is good. Uh, do I still think Kevin Biggio isn't worth a roster spot? Absolutely. You saw last year, you saw in the playoffs especially, he can't hit a major league fastball, and he has no position. He's just not good. Thoughts on Dylan Carlson's peak. I think he's going to be a star. He's in my top 10 because I think he's going to be a star. I think he's going to be an on-base power guy who can be at least an average defender in center or plus in right. And he's, I mean, he is going to get on base. I think he's got that right balance of patience with some aggressiveness. Now, there's always the risk with these high walk prospects that they're just passive. They're just up there taking walks. Kevin Biggio, for example. Jeremy Hermita, named from the past, first rounder. Drew 100 walks in double A, if I remember correctly and just never could hit in the big leagues because it turned out he was too passive. And I really didn't think that was the case. I thought, nope, he's going to get there, and he is going to get those 2 3 one counts, and he's going to attack. And he would get to 2-0, and he would get to 3-1, and he would just... you got to be able to take advantage of the plate discipline. 
I think Carlson can do that. I believe Carlson will do that. Uh, Kevin Biggio is the fifth best second baseman in baseball. No, he's not. <laughs> you can just make stuff up, but I don't have to agree with you. Love the Corbin Carroll love. Re-up my athletic sub because of you, Keith. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Corbin Carroll, very underrated, I think. I, and I mean by the by the audience, not by the industry. Maybe a little bit by the industry because he's only 5'10". Uh, but he's from the Pacific Northwest. He was a high school draft and he's with Arizona. Those are not things that make you hyped, right? We're getting more questions. I'm getting more questions about Jason Dominguez than Corbin Carroll. Why? Jason Dominguez, he's got those Twitter videos. He plays for the Yankees. He got $5 million dollars. Corbin Carroll's pretty good. And Carroll is more advanced of a player right now. He's probably going to get to the big leagues sooner than Dominguez. Not definitely, but probably. And that's, I'm not picking on Dominguez either, but just saying there are some things that go into players getting more or less hype from on the media side or on the fan side. I do think within the industry, people are pretty in on Corbin Carroll. There will always be some doubters until he does it in the big leagues because he's under six feet. Guess what? So is Alex Bregman. Alex Bregman is barely taller than I am. I met Alex Bregman, looked him right in the eye. I did not have to, it's not like Aaron judge where I was like, so you can be five ten, you can hit, you can hit for power and you can nearly win an MVP award. With the J set at shortstop with Bo, where do I see Groshans and Martin playing? I, I will say, I, I kind of wish they put Bichette at second. I think he'll be great there. Um, they're going to develop Martin as a shortstop and I would like to see how that goes. I think Martin's an elite defensive third baseman, though. And then they could, um, if he can't play short, but he's an elite defensive third baseman, then you move Groshans somewhere else. You move, you try Groshans in another position. The nice thing is they are two years apart, I think, age wise, year and a half apart. So they may not necessarily arrive at the same time. Martin is a polished, pretty polished college player who came out of Vanderbilt. He should move quickly through the low minors. Whereas Groshans has six weeks in low A, they'll probably move him to high A just because, because you know, then I send him back to the same spot. But don't be surprised if Groshans just needs some more time to catch up because not only did he miss all of 2020, but he missed nearly all of 2019. Uh, I'll just take one or two more here. Uh, how do I think Cleveland did? That's not their team name anymore. But how do I think the <clears throat> racist team name did in the return for the Lindor trade? Thank you for doing this chat. Uh, you're welcome. I think they did fine considering the circumstances. Lindor has a year left and everyone knows he's going to free agency. He was rejecting overtures from Cleveland to try to extend it. He, and he's made it clear he wants to, he wanted to go to free agency. And this was a really bad time to shop, shop a shortstop. It was a good shortstop free agent class. So, Cleveland was kind of in a poor, uh, there was oversupply. They were in a poor competitive position. They were sellers when there were lots of other sellers and not enough buyers. So I think they did fine, but they had to take some risks. They had to take Ahmed Rosario as kind of a prospect who hasn't panned out. They had to take two really interesting prospects in Green and Wolf who are years and years away because they weren't getting elite prospects back for one year of Lindor when everyone knew he was leaving. And again, there just weren't a lot of other suitors. Um, a lot of the other teams that needed shortstops didn't have the prospect. The Phillies weren't going to match that offer. They didn't have young big leaguers slash high upside prospects. They could trade to match what the Mets were offering. Uh, Orioles going to try to keep Adley and Grayson down all season. My guess is yes, but I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, Adley Rutschman in June, it'll be two years since he was drafted. College guys make it in two years. That wouldn't shock me if they brought him up at some point, maybe not April 1st, but maybe in June. I could see that. Uh, last question. Which Twins prospects have a good chance to make the top 100 next year? So let's assume Karoloff, since he made his debut in the playoffs, um, let's assume he graduates. Lewis is probably still on the list. Balzovich is probably still on the list. Uh, Juan Doran could be on the list, could graduate. Not sure. Um uh, I don't know if Larnick gets on the list. I mean, there's questions I'd like to see answered, but they may not be answered until he gets to play some more in the high minors. Uh, would really like to see Keone Cavaco. What does he get to do in a full season? Uh, what does Blaine Anlo look like? I hear good things. I hear that the projection has really started to come. Uh, I always liked the delivery. I thought it worked. I thought he was athletic, but I thought there was some deception to it too, which is kind of a rare combination. We haven't seen him 
So I think they have a lot of guys, a lot of really interesting guys in that system, but it's just hard to make too much of a projection on guys who who've not played much slash we just haven't seen them in 15 months or more to know if they've actually gotten better the way that they've supposedly gotten better. There's no substitute for game experience, whether it's for play, developing players or for evaluation. And so I am operating as most of us are uh, with, with uh, you know, sort of with one eye closed at this point and hoping we get maybe minor league spring training in April, minor league games at some point in May, and we can get back to a process of evaluating and in my case, ranking players like what we had in the past. All right. Well, that's all I've gone for about 45 minutes, which is actually more than I think I was supposed to go, but that's okay. I was having a good time. So I really appreciate those of you uh, who joined me for this. I'll just reiterate the top 100 ranking. It went up last Thursday. You've got to be a subscriber to the athletic. You can go right to that article. You can go to the athletic.com slash K L A W for our current offer, which I believe is a three ninety nine a month discounted subscription. The rank, the list not ranked, of 12 players who just missed the top 100 also for subscribers went up on Monday, uh, as did my ranking, uh, sorry, my evaluation of the Nolan Arenado trade. The next piece of the top 100 will be the organization rankings that will run at some point after the Super Bowl, I believe on February 10th, followed by my team by team reports ranking 20 prospects in each of the 30 organizations running one division a day for the week following that. Thank you again so much for watching and for reading. I really appreciate it. Stay safe, everybody.